So now in this next video and next flowchart, we're going to continue our discussion on reproductive isolation by entitling the next flowchart as I've done already, Reproductive Isolation 2. And we're going to reiterate to ourselves that we're still looking at uh, prezygotic mechanisms for this type of reproductive isolation. And let's remind ourselves that these mechanisms occur before zygote formation. In essence, these mechanisms are a result of preventing mating attempts altogether or preventing fertilization altogether, and sometimes even both. Again, let's keep this idea of macroevolution in our head. We're trying to develop a broad pattern of evolution that occurs above the species level. In essence, we're trying to complete speciation, the process by which one species splits into two or more. And we're seeing that all over the place right now with something as important as reproductive isolation. So let's finish off the prezygotic mechanisms. We completed one through three. We're now going to continue that discussion by looking at number four, which is now, uh, which we'll call mechanical isolation. So number four will be mechanical isolation. And it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, this I just like to think of as lock doesn't fit with key. There is clearly um, going to be, in this situation, there's actually going to be a mating attempt. Mating attempt will happen. So we actually have not prevented the mating attempt altogether, but you know what it ha does happen? So even though the mating attempt happens, so we'll say mating attempt happens, dot, dot, dot. I just want to rewrite that. Mating attempt happens, and then we'll say dot, 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 but, but, okay, even though the mating attempt happens, the sexual structures themselves, okay, the sexual structures, the sexual um, anatomy of the two individuals uh, who are trying this reproduction event, this mating event, the sexual structures actually prevent the successful mating, okay, prevent successful mating. So even though you tried mating, you are not successfully mating. That's what we mean by prevent mating attempts. Though the prevention of the attempt hasn't completely happened, we've certainly prevented fertilization because we have prevented successful mating. So again, what does this all mean in terms of reality? We always like to look at real life examples because we know this information from real life examples. So let's look at real life examples of mechanical isolation. One of the big examples of mechanical isolation in the animal world actually comes from the insect world. Um, this is the idea of what I've mentioned previously, the idea of lock and key genitalia. And lock and key genitalia are often seen um, within the insects that are observed. Lock and key genitalia in many insects, aka if the lock doesn't fit the key, you will have mechanical isolation, and thus within these insects you will have speciation events. You will have reproductive isolation events because of a prezygotic mechanism that occurs before zygote formation known as mechanical isolation utilized to prevent either mating attempts or prevent fertilization. Of course, if the lock doesn't fit the key, you will prevent fertilization altogether. So that's a good example from our insect um, friends. And we also have one more example um, one more example over here, we can write down um, our floral structures actually from the flower world. And specifically, um, in this situation, floral structures, what we have is, remember how we talked about temporal isolation before in the dendrium, the dendrobium, those uh, genus of orchids? Well, right now, in some flowers, what we actually see is a little bit more specificity, not just because of time, but actually because specific pollinators, so the pollen that comes from specific pollinators, can only, only match up and pollinate with specific flowers. So that's the, again, sort of the idea of lock and key, but a little bit more broad in the sense that the pollen has to match up with the right flower. That pollen has to mechanically fit or mechanically um, get on the right flower so that the mating can be successful. And if it's not, then we have an event known as mechanical isolation because we have prevented mating um, through the prevention. We, have, we haven't prevented mating per se, but we've definitely prevented fertilization. We have created a mechanism that occurs before zyg zygote formation to prevent um, reproduction, reproduction isolation. And finally, um, another great, great example of reproductive isolation number five is gametic isolation. So this is going to take it a bit of a step further in the sense that um, 
so far we've looked at a lot of things that prevent mating attempts. Right now with number four, we've actually seen a mating attempt, but we've prevented fertilization. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to see a mating attempt, but we're going to prevent fertilization because of gametic isolation. So let's remember, gamete means sperm and egg. So what we're going to see here is specifically very, very powerful because this is actually on a molecular or chemical scale, meaning that there are molecular or chemical differences so we'll say molecular or chem differences um, between species. And specifically, this is going to be between species um, uh, in reference to a species egg versus another species sperm. There's a molecular or chemical difference in terms of the gametes that are between species. Um, in, in essence, what we're saying here um, essentially is that the egg and the sperm of two different species in question, of two reproductively isolated species, the egg and the sperm are essentially incompatible. Okay, They are incompatible. They do not work together. Um, mechanical isolation, on the other hand, is not the fact that the egg and sperm are incompatible. That might also be true, but over here I just failed to mention this. This is not the fact that there's an incompatibility at the gamete level, but there's actually an incompatibility in terms of body parts. So we're going to say body parts are incompatible, aka the lock doesn't fit the key. Incompatible. Over here, Yes, the body parts may be compatible. They may not even be a question when we look at the example, but what's going to be of note is that the egg and sperm specific, specifically are incompatible, and thus this is what's going to directly prevent fertilization. So we'll say prevents F-E-R-T for fertilization. Look what we have right there, prevent fertilization. Of course we are. This is a prezygotic, reproductively isolating mechanism. So again, we want to put some examples, some faces to the names that we have here of gametic isolation. So, an example of gametic isolation that we see very often in the ocean world is actually within um, aquatic organisms. So we're going to write aquatic organisms. And in the aquatic organisms, what we see is um, such organisms uh, release uh, tons and tons and tons of gametes in the water. Release gametes into water. It's basically a big... Uh, free for all of gametes floating all over the all over the water. What's preventing a sperm from whatever species that we're talking about and an egg from a different species from fertilizing each other? Of course, there's a gametic isolation event. They are both have they both have the opportunity to um, you know meet up with each other. But what's going to prevent the sperm from actually fertilizing the egg? In these aquatic organisms that release all their gametes into the water, a good sub-example that we'll look at is actually the sponge. And it's a great, great um, example because the sponge is a great organism to study um, for us as scientists because it's very easy to manipulate, it's very viewable, and it's very understandable. You'll see what I mean. Um, so when we see uh, for this sub-example, we have sponges. In sponges, what we notice, and this is incredible, this is how specific sponges are. As simple as they are, as you'll see in Bio 2, this is how specific their reproductive isolation mechanisms are. The sponges actually have specific egg receptors. Now that looks molecular and chemical to me. I don't know about you. Egg receptors, that seems rather molecular, rather chemical. These egg receptors, um, so egg receptors that are on the surface, on surface of the egg, of course, on surface of egg, but specifically these surface egg receptors are there and they only, that only bind to, what do you think? That only bind with own species sperm with own species sperm. So there has to be a chemical molecular check. There's a checks and balances that the sponges do in which the egg receptors that are on the egg have to match up with the sperm um, co-receptors, let's say, that have to come onto the egg surface and say, hey, I'm also a sponge sperm. Um, let me in. Let me fertilize this egg. And that's exactly what happens so long as the receptors match up. This is a very powerful, very specific isolation event that utilizes gametic isolation. Why is it gametic? Of course, because we're looking at egg and sperm, two different gametes in the sponge world.
And finally, the last one that we'll look at, it's a bit of a broader example, but it still makes sense. It's very easy to understand. Um, sometimes what we actually have is we do have mating. We do have successful mating. We do have a successful mating attempt that's happened, but we're still going to prevent fertilization because of the idea of internal fertilization. Okay, there has to be, so this is external fertilization. Sponges and all aquatic organisms that do this, this is external because what are they doing? They're releasing gametes into the water, into the environment, into their external environment. But what happens if you have sperm entering the internal environment of a female? This is something that we've seen in humans, okay? But how do we see this in the gametic isolation world? Well, what we see is if we have an internal fertilization event as opposed to an external like the sponges, in internal fertilization, we do see um, this occur, right? Let's say internal fertilization occurs. Okay, cool. So we, we weren't able to uh, stop this, but we're going to stop it with this prevention of fertilization. How? Well, this is what's going to happen. Let's say infer internal fertilization occurs, but, but this is the caveat here, but the sperm as it's traveling within this internal female environment um, actually becomes unable to survive. Sperm is unable to survive because it is absolutely just chemically and molecularly unable to go through what we call the female reproductive tract. Unable to survive in female, female repro tract. Sorry for the messy writing at this very end. So overall, we've covered five different reproductive isolation mechanisms. Gametic isolation is rather specific. Um, four and five, I would say, are the only ones that actually uh, aren't directly preventing mating attempts, but they are definitely preventing fertilization. Uh, one through three are definitely doing both because they're uh, one through three are mainly dedicated to preventing mating and thus preventing fertilization as a sub-result. Uh, very powerful mechanisms. Again, the idea right now now is speciation. We want to do a big evolution. We want to do macro evolution. We want to create species. A good way to diverge species, to separate species from one another, is to make sure that they're reproductively isolated, utilizing prezygotic mechanisms. This is a good way to do speciation in a nutshell. We're now going to move forward and not look at prezygotic mechanisms, but look at postzygotic mechanisms. What happens if we do have sperm plus egg? How do we make sure that there's still some sort of reproductive isolation? That's what we'll look at in the next video.